Hello guys, welcome to the final, to the last episode of From the North of the Year 2021. Our first year on air, and what a year has it been? What a year has it been? How's it going, Hermania? How's it going? Happy holidays, everyone. Happy it's holidays. our one and only holiday special slash last episode of the year. Yeah, yeah. Um... So we're, we're just gonna talk about gonna what we've been through. It's been it's been a weird year. It's 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 been a messed up year. Uh, we're just gonna go through like uh, maybe a recap of what's going on and how the stage is set for the year two thousand and twenty one. Um, before we get started, you want to say anything here? So yeah, you know, um, before we started recording, Elu and I were talking about how we're going into year three of this pandemic. I mean. I think a lot of us thought that with the vaccine and this year, um, things really seem to be going back to normal. So I think it's very discouraging for all of us on this planet that we're still going to be dealing with this issue for who knows when. Uh, I was just saying I had a trip planned for next year that I was super excited about. And slowly all my uh, flights are getting canceled. Um, so, yeah, you know, I just want to send a message. I know these times are hard for a lot of people, especially when it comes to like depression and anxiety. And um, Elo and I certainly understand those issues and how, you know, these type of lockdowns can make them worse or make us feel worse so we're here for you guys we're struggling too and hopefully eventually we'll get back to normal it, it's certainly a tough time to be a young adult no like I was, why couldn't we be alive in the 90s when everyone was just like living it up <laughs> imagine if we were born like 10 years prior 20 years prior we could have at least be like young adults in Venezuela in the 90s. And, we you know, would have had a country. We would have had a country. That. It would have been fun. But no, now my concerns are that my university is going back online on January. And let me tell you something. Online teaching, it sucks. It's ass. You don't learn anything. And, and honestly, it's, it's depressing like you said. But, you know... We're here for you guys. You're here for us. Let's get all the press but it. together. Let's do yeah. it for another 2021. Yeah. All right. Exactly. <laughs> and since we weren't born in the 80s, sadly, we're going to talk about the year of our life, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, sorry. So... Yeah, it's hard times here. We said so. And also, uh, apologies that we weren't here last week, but Elu has still in school and we're dealing with life. So, and we're recording this super early, which is hard for both of us. But, you know, we, we're doing what we can. It's so early in the morning. You guys don't know yeah. how much we love you. <laughs> exactly. So, Elu, let's start um, our little recount with the last thing that happened this year, which happened last week. And those were elections in Chile. So, you know, I was surprised because usually I feel like the international community doesn't pay attention to Latin America, which I've never understood because it's a very important region where very interesting things and insane and crazy things are always happening. But the international community seemed to really pay attention to these last presidential elections in Chile, where the left wing candidate won. Um, now, that's, I think the, the reason the international community paid so much attention is because of the protests that we saw in Chile. Was it 2020, 2019? Honestly, I think they go to the streets um, every year. Every other year they go right, to the streets. So so we've had we've seen in Chile a lot of discontent over um, economic and social inequality. Chile has constantly been uh, one of the strongest and fastest growing economies in Latin America, but um, that has come with inequality, as it happens in a lot of big economies, and that has brought a lot of social uh, unrest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. This particular election, to me, um, it sucked because, it you know, they, they had, besides the fact, of course, that it's amazing that Chile has a democracy. It's amazing that they get to vote in a free and fair uh, process. It's amazing that the far right candidate, as he's called, I'm not an expert in this, um, uh, conceded uh quickly and elegantly, unlike our far-right candidate in the U.S. Um, however, 
the reason I'm not celebrating the results, like I see a lot of people celebrating that the far right lost. Well, yes, that's good. But to me, the far left won. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be celebrating that, even though an, an Edu will say his take on this, which is different than mine, because in the primaries, there was an actual uh, communist candidate. So so that's the one people saw as the far left. However, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel is his first name? Gabriel Boric, yeah. Gabriel Boric, um, you know, he's a student leader. He has the profile uh, as a youth. He was a revolutionary leftist. He has a past of supporting Chavez. Um, he has a past of supporting 21st century socialism, of supporting figures like Che Guevara. Um, now, people around the world, as they should, have made a big point of saying This is a new left because in Latin America, because unlike people like Lula da Silva, Cristina Kirchner, Evo Morales, um, new blood like Gabriel Boric says that Venezuela is a dictatorship, that Cuba is a dictatorship, that Nicaragua is a dictatorship. So to many people, this is a sign that this leftist is going to go the democratic route and is not going to be an ally of the trifecta of dictatorships in the region. However, My personal take, and I should be allowed to have this take because when I said this on Twitter, I get all these progressive people treating me like I'm a fascist. But I don't have to be a leftist. And I'm not going to be happy when a leftist that believes in the speech of 21st century socialism gets elected. Because, and I am very firm about this, and I've written a lot about this, I get very anxious when I see people marking a difference between the government of Hugo Chavez and the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro. Because, first of all, Chavez already had a dictatorship. We've talked about this a lot. And the way I see this new left that the rest of the world so badly wants to believe in in Latin America is that they do believe in the Chavez project in 21st century socialism. They just think that these three countries didn't do it right. They just didn't do it the right way. They fell into corruption. But to me, 21st century socialism fundamentally is wrong for our countries and fundamentally is authoritarian and fundamentally destroys the, the economies of countries. So while I wish Chile the best, and I do hope for a new left, just like I hope for a democratic right, I hope for a democratic left because that's how politics works. But I'm not out here cheering for Gabriel Boric. I'm not going to do it. Sorry. And now you'll see a different take. Go, Edu. <laughs> well, my, my take is different on, on, on different aspects, right? Uh, I do agree. Uh, I'm going to start with that. That uh, socialism is never the way. <laughs> like, <clears throat> collectivizing the means of production of a country at a massive scale, uh, particularly Uh, it's always a bad decision. Um, I don't know if that's what Boric has in mind. Hopefully that's not the case. Uh, but what I will say though is that I do consider positive that there's the this existence of the new left because I can disagree with you ideologically. If you're a leftist, you believe in socialism, it's fine that we can disagree ideologically. But As long as you're out there supporting democracy in your own country and abroad, my man, you can do whatever you want. So I don't want to get my hopes up too much because, again, I'm a person and I'm completely biased. I'm traumatized by the left. The left has ruined my life and many others, especially in Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. Uh, and I'm going to wait this one on the bench and see what Boric does. If, uh, if he ends up being a good president for Chile, ends up taking them further, at, ends up uh, diminishing these uh, inequality gaps that are very real and they exist in Chile, uh, that's good for them. Uh, if he does end up being, you know what, at the front, at, uh, denouncing the, the, the socialist dictatorships that we currently have in, in, in the Americas, That's also great, but I don't want to get my hopes up. The only thing that I know is that it's never good news when you have someone that's in 
that's that describes itself as a socialist and that takes it to the point where they really go about their ideo uh, ideology um because there's there, there's like different kinds of socialists right like i don't know what boric is gonna be i don't know if he's gonna be like a far left uh president like knows. like a no lot of people knows. no one knows i don't know if he's instead gonna be a, a mild socialist like socialists in spain for example are which are mm -hmm. you know, really they're social democrats they're I mean, social democrats yeah the, the word the s word is such a problem for us yeah <laughs> um and even i like i sometimes consider myself to be a social democrat because it's it's not a bad system we you know? are social democrats but that isn't socialism <laughs> it's like my whole point that's it so i'm just gonna give the benefit of the doubt to boric uh, i trust in Ch chilean institutions to be holding strong enough in case something else tries to happen um I do believe that sometimes new blood, uh, young blood, it's it's very needed, much needed. Uh, He's in, in, the second youngest uh, world leader. Yeah, he 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 was just a student leader like ten years ago, and now he's the president elect of Chile. Which, um, by the way, that's another red flag for me. But yes. whatever. Like he has no government experience whatsoever. That is a red flag. I do agree. But then again, and I've been thinking this a lot, there's also the odd chance that this guy ends up being like a leftist Bukele, and that will be funny, but it wouldn't be good for Chile and the region. So I'm just going to wait this one on the sides, see what happens. Congratulations for, to, to Chile for having a, a beautiful democracy where you guys vote, you have your results in like an hour, and, and the opposition immediately concedes and, and life moves on. Congratulations, Chile, for Which, that. I'm sorry, I'm pedantic. I have to do it. A lot of people that were on those in those protests in Chile were acting as if they lived in tyranny. They said it. They were, you know, talking about the uh, Piñera government as if it was a dictatorship. Yeah, uh, and, and it's not true. It's, it's, it's not, just not true. It's not true. It, it's like it's one of the things. For example, when uh, Gabriel Boric denounced uh, the government of Nicolás Maduro, he did it in a way that's very dishonest. He's like. You are a human rights violator, like Piñera, so we don't like you. It's like, oh, it's oh like, yes, I saw that. I forgot like, to mention that. Yeah, I, oh, it's like, yeah. I, I appreciate no. the intent, but like, like, come on, come on. Like, I don't come appreciate on. the intent. The intent <laughs> is to trivialize a real dictatorship and try to compare it with a flawed democracy. And that's what I don't like. And or, that's why I don't trust the guy. Or is to exaggerate what the government of Piñera was to equalize it to the dictatorship of Venezuela. I don't know what his agenda is, but but that's not honest and that's not right. But whatever, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and see what happens. He got there democratically elected. So far, he has been very democratic. He hasn't had a day in office. So so he has been very <laughs> you know, you have to have single office. This is I don't get it. I see all these progressive Venezuelans like trying so hard to give him a chance, like with. A... But like, but I get it, and and I was reading this from a Venezuelan person living in Chile who has lived okay. there for many, many, many years, and it's Boric represents a, a a sense of change from what they've been used to for the last several several years like they keep voting for a new alternative and it's the not anti establishment working. it's the, it's the anti-establishment happening all over the world actually a lot of analysts have been saying that um latin america is taking a turn for the left i don't think it is it's actually just taking and vote against the incumbent uh, I, situation. I, I don't know because I do think that for better or for worse South America in particular is turning a shift uh, it's turning left and I will say overall Latin America is like and now next year the expectation is there are going to be presidential elections in Colombia uh, and the leftist candidate Petro who is another character uh, he has very good chances of doing something on those elections if not winning uh, in Brazil, we're going to have Lula versus Bolsonaro. That's going to be the biggest idiot ball of all time. We're going to have the far right lunatic supporting Bolsonaro and the far left lunatic supporting Lula da Silva. And the expectation is that Lula is probably going to be reelected. So we're seeing a shift towards the left in South America and in Latin America in general. And that's where we really need to see how true it you is know that there's going to be a new left or not. 
farther than you know the rise of the left what i i'm seeing here is something so so concerning which is hyperpolarization and the rise of the extremes in every election that we have seen this year and will see next year it's the far right against the far left I mean, we saw it in Peru this year as well. Oh, we forgot about those elections. That was yeah, this year. That was this year too, yeah. Well, but I mean, I, with all due respect to Peru, Peru presidential elections have become kind of meaningless in the, in the recent Easily years. Easily reversible. Easily reversible. Easily reversible. They're already talking about, you know, getting rid of Castillo yeah. and voting for a new president. Don't last long um, in Peru. But still, we, we have to talk about it. It was fucking. Oh, whatever. I curse here all the time. I don't know why I got. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> Christmas. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I was trying to be better. Um, no, it was freaking Fujimori's daughter against an actual communist. Yeah, and uh, again, that that speaks to you all the levels of polarization that we're seeing, and 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 I believe Peru really demonstrates the reason behind it is that people are kind of tired of voting for what they consider to be the establishment, which tends to be just. Your good old liberal but corrupt government in South America, and they're being convinced by the most populist extremes uh, to vote for uh, for, for what they have to propose, right? And it's just the the legacy of what we're seeing at the tent that we're seeing all across the world, which is exactly what you said: the rights of the extremes, the rights of populism. Um, it really started to pick up with Donald Trump in 2016, but we're still seeing the effects of that in Latin America. We're still seeing the effects of that in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe and, and Southern Europe, uh, where even in France, uh, where the more radical populist candidates are starting to gain uh, momentum over what is considered to be the establishment. So, yeah, weird times that we're living. Unfortunately, you know, South America, it's already unstable as it is. So when populism becomes a fat all over the world, it just we take it and we make it 10 times worse. I actually always say that we sort of started this new wave of evil with Chavez. Think? think about it. Yeah. I, yeah, you you say it's you said you know that Trump spread it, but no, but I, like I will say that this new wave really, really took off with with Donald Trump in twenty sixteen. Well, of course, because when the leader of the free world is like that, it's gonna be more impactful than little Chavez. But Chavez did impact Latin America. I mean, the did. pink tide was because of him. Uh, I always tell people to watch the Oliver Stone propaganda documentary and that really shows you um but oh anyway, yeah we've talked about uh the countries falling to the left but then we also have to mention el salvador because el salvador is becoming a player internationally mostly because of the bitcoin situation like Jesus the Christ. first world is all and they're fascinated by the millennial uh precedents but not, oh. like we said now boric is a millennial president as well um so and the thing with we'll Bukele see. the thing with Bukele though is that Bukele is not democratic like it was it was it was clear during the first years of his presidency that he wasn't democratic when he moved in troops into the parliament um and just the way that he rules overall he's a millennial that's like drunk with power and can do whatever he wants virtually whatever he wants with the country including making bitcoin an official coin now taking the politics aside it is pretty cool that a country <laughs> is embracing bitcoin i personally believe that we're eventually gonna go there all of us uh but it's very cool that a country is doing it having that said if it's doing it from a perspective from an undemocratic perspective in an unorganized manner as we've seen in el salvador which nobody knows how the bitcoin system works and it takes like five minutes to make a payment with bitcoin when it takes 20 seconds with a credit card but i digress I just don't want to see more populist leaders coming you up in Latin America. So interesting, and this is uh shows the horseshoe theory that we're always talking about. Yeah, Bukele has started using like the um usual leftist rhetoric against the U.S. by saying, you know, because the U.S. has 
giving out statements that they're concerned about Bukele's uh, authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And the response could have been from Chavez, you know, do not try to get your hands in our internal affairs. This is American imperialism trying to tell us what to do. Don't you come telling us what to do. It's the same rhetoric. It's it's, It's exactly the same. It's the same rhetoric. It doesn't matter if you come from the left or from the right. Oh my gosh, do you think that we would eventually see? No, because that's such a big part of his brand. Like, would Bukele ally himself with the other anti-imperialists of the region? I don't know. I've seen the other authoritarian regimes. I don't know. That's the thing about populism. Nothing really matters once you go to right. power. So maybe, maybe we're gonna see Bukele and Lula and Boris. Can you and, imagine? And, and I, <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen. And that's what makes this show so great. This particular show so great because this is the holiday special where we can vent to you our uncertainties, our expectations and our expectations are is that we really don't know what the fuck's gonna happen next year the facts are that um the numbers say that democracies have been falling yes. all around the world yes um the pandemic has not been good for this because we, we we've also talked about how um the overlap between you know authoritarianism and uh, the measures that governments have to take to contain yeah. pandemics, which of course it's easier for a dictatorship to contain it because they have so much control over the population. So it's definitely not a good time for democracy or democratic values. Um, as we saw this year, Venezuela is, I mean, w- <laughs> We have to include it in a recount of this year. Eh? Venezuela? We want to talk about what's going on in Venezuela. Well, just the state of affairs <laughs> is pretty simple. We started the year with, with, a, a, with, with a stalemate. Well, yeah, with a stalemate between two presidents. Um, we had fake elections there, too, that you guys saw. Legitimize the regime, further split the opposition, and Venezuela, the, the, the establishment of opposition really is non-existent at this point in Venezuela. Um, but of course, uh, the international community, well, I wouldn't say the international community. I don't even know who to make responsible for this. But uh, it's planned that, Wh- Why- I forgot his name, Juan Guaido, Juan Guaido. Um, will be sworn in uh, as interim president again next year without any sort of support. democratic process, yes. support. Yes. Um, so we're going on a, is it the third year or the fourth? Of, of Guaido's presidency? Yeah. <laughs> so this it started in 2019. So this will be the third, we're starting oh gosh, the third with year. With the pandemic, the pandemic goes with Guaido's Gu- presidency. Gu- Guaido has one more year than the, Gu- Gu- Guaido is one year older than the pandemic. But yeah, that's, uh, as you said, it's, we are really at a point in at least for venezuela where the maduro regime seems to be very secure very tight in power uh the opposition most of the opposition has pretty much seemed to like give in uh to what the government has to offer and they're now back participating in their phony elections but that's that's the absolute state of venezuelan that's elections, fake elections yeah. which we saw in venezuela this year and we saw in nicaragua yes. where uh, ortega and murillo cemented their dictatorship um in a, it, in such an open manner it's not that like they even try to like because that's that's the other thing about the nicaragua dictatorship is that Unlike maybe Venezuela, unlike Cuba, which at least they're making the best efforts to like try to keep the form so it's easier for them to lie about what they're doing. And the Nicaragua government didn't give a fuck. In the matter of six months to a year, every single major political opposition candidate was imprisoned, persecuted, exiled, or killed. And even those, some of those who were exiled to other countries, some of them had attempts to their life by assassins sent out by the Nicaraguan regime. So, like, they went from zero to a hundred in the span of six months, and they are cemented as a dictatorship in the region. But I will say that I'm glad to see most governments in the Americas being pretty much clear about that from the get-go, including our our aforementioned friend Gabriel Boric. But 
I just want to repeat once again that this new left that their concept is believing in 21st century socialism, but denouncing the clear disasters that the ideas that they believed in brought in. I don't believe it. It doesn't convince me because it, again, Maduro is Chavez's legacy. It's one and the same thing. So you can't just denounce the horror now, but support the ideas that led to that horror. Like, that's just not going to fool me. But we're going to see what happens. And for, for the well-being of Chile and Latin America, um, I hope that Boric does a good job because Chile is the strongest country in Latin America. And as such, we cannot lose it. It's going to go through fundamental changes, a new constitution, a new economic model, if we believe uh, the, the new, newly elected president. So, so I hope for the well-being of everyone we all that... Do that he's democratic and that he doesn't destroy the economy because yes there is a lot of inequality in chile but it's still one of the largest economies of the region and i would like it to stay a good economy and 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 that's i guess an important point that there's something that uh socialist in politics have been doing ever since socialism became a thing um in the mid 19th century is that they always have the same proposals every time that someone gets into power with socialist ideas and they start pushing out these proposals they obviously don't work and you know they end up importing the country or turning it into a dictatorship and then the new socialist the new blood of socialism would say oh this guy wasn't real socialism I am the real socialism. Let's try this again, and so on. And mm, so yeah, let's so try it again. But but we know the things to look uh to look into in the beginning of a government like this. The N word, nationalization of industries. That's a big no no. Regulation, extreme regulation of private industry, Cen persecution of the private industry, censorship. So so we're on alert, Gabrielito. We're watching. Prove, prove we, us wrong, please, yeah. please, for the love of God, be a good president and prove us wrong. Um, but El, we also have to give a shout out to the Cuban people who this year were one of the protagonists of uh, the fight for freedom all around the world. Um, truly historic, I would say the Cuba protests uh, were one of the most important things uh, to happen this uh, year after, I mean, more than a decade of just nothing happening. Um, Cuban people rose up. They were brutally persecuted, as always. Um, the world might have forgotten about the July 11th protest, but there are hundreds of young people still in jail because of them um, for things as simple as recording someone protesting. Uh, people have been uh, condemned to eight years in prison. Um, so... Our eyes will be on Cuba as well next year. We are we know how hard it is to start any any type of civil protest in Cuba because that is a totalitarian regime. I mean, speaking of, I wouldn't call Venezuela yet a totalitarian regime because you Maybe. can you can still uh, do certain things uh, not allowed by the regime, but in Cuba, I mean, yeah. nothing moves without Big Brother seeing it. So. Yeah. Um, we also have to remember the Cuban people. And now let's get ready for next year. We, we've already kind of touched upon it, but something major for early next year, according to analysts, Putin's plans for early 2022 are to, you know, Invade get Ukraine. himself some Ukraine, some more Ukraine. So uh, we did a whole episode on this, and you guys are more than welcome to go watch it if you want to get, like, the full... Uh, context the full juice of what this topic uh is about really uh but yeah essentially we are seeing all of the red flags that are pointing towards a russian invasion to ukraine Ro russia has mobilized almost two hundred thousand troops to the border and it's not that they just mobilized troops they mobilized war equipment with them we're talking anti-mine equipment anti-aircraft equipment all the things that you will require in order to do an invasion they pushed this to the border of ukraine they've already they're telling western diplomats to leave they're telling western diplomats to leave they already 
telling everyone that they're gonna do it they're not even trying to hide it they're threatening nato like they're they're setting the stage for what's about to happen and oh, I, I get it. hopefully we are wrong hopefully n nothing happens but in our experience in this show we tend to be more right than not <laughs> So it's very likely that a Ukraine invasion is going to be perpetrated by the Russian government. So again, it's the, the same thing that we've been saying, like the, Ukraine should be a hard line for Russia and, and Europe. And this is really going to depend not whether or not Russia does invade Ukraine or not. It's really going to depend on what the reaction of Europe and North America and the rest of the democratic world has to this invasion. Are they just going to let it happen? This, this depended on the reaction to the invasion of Crimea. Of That's Crimea. why they're doing this now. Exactly. So, like, the world already failed Ukraine when they allowed Russia to take Crimea. If Russia launches another mass scale invasion of Ukraine and no one does anything about it, then Russia will know that they just have free playground all over europe to do whatever they want right so and in this show we're always talking about you know the three superpowers the u.s russia china no matter what tankies say the u.s is not out here conquering lands but russia and china are and another thing to look forward to next year is china's attacks into taiwan yeah you know more about that than myself do we is that a serious threat so it's it is a serious threat it is not as evident as it is in the case of russia and crimea that that, that one's going to happen sooner or later uh but yes china has been doing a lot of military drills and exercises very threatening exercises on their sea close to Taiwan, even sometimes flying and into and getting into Taiwan's uh, sea and airspace, uh, effectively exerting their sovereignty. Because from the perspective of China, Taiwan yeah. is just a province of China. So yeah. for them, those are their waters. For them, that's their airspace. So they were not threatening anyone according to them. But in the reality, well, but Putin has the same argument about Ukraine. exactly, exactly. <laughs> but in reality, this is just obviously flexing their muscle to to Taiwan. Uh, the thing about Taiwan, though, is that it's a lot more sensitive to the whole global politics situation than it is for Ukraine, and for the simple reason of what Taiwan represents economically. Taiwan has essentially a monopoly on the production of some of the most important components that we use on computers and on telephones and cars and everything electronic today. So whoever controls Taiwan basically controls the production of most things digital, including computers. So I personally think that, you know, if, if, if China decides to invade Taiwan, that one's not going to go as smoothly as an invasion of Ukraine could be. I know this sounds insane. But that's just my personal opinion, just because of the importance of Taiwan. But then again, we've seen China doing a lot of threatening exercises, saying that they will invade Taiwan because that is their territory and threatening everyone else who dares to be on their way, I guess, of doing this. So I don't know if that's going to happen. If I had to take a guess, I will say that I'm third. I'm there's a 30% chance that something is actually going to happen, but I don't know. But anyway, we're going to keep an eye on that because that, that is important. Taiwan is another bastion of democracy, one of the few bastions of democracy that are, are left in East Asian countries. Uh, we cannot see a repeat of what happened in Hong Kong, especially in the scale of what will happen to Taiwan if something does happen. Right. So... Of course, we're going to keep an eye on Chinese and Russian imperialism next year, as well as the elections that we have coming up. Um, I'm particularly mm -hmm. concerned about Colombia, where a, a former FARC leader, yes. um, Gustavo Petro, is seen. And, and, you know, 
in Colombia, it's it's a situation that reminds me a little bit of what happened in Chile because there is inequality, there is social unrest, and a lot of people started seeing uh, the current president, Ivan Duque, as some sort of far-right fascist, which is just not the case whatsoever. Yeah, it's an acceleration. Um, so, so now a lot of people are seeing this election in Colombia as the far right against just the left, because they never say far left. But Ivan Duque, is, sorry, Gustavo Petro, is very much the far left. Oh, yeah. Um, and a, support, a loud supporter of the dictatorships in the region. So, and well, Colombia is another one, what? Apparently, according to Petro himself, it's no longer supporting the governments of Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. But, and here's the thing, that was very recent. Because, like, as recent as 2017, 2018, when, like, crisis was at the worst it's ever been in Venezuela, Petro was one of the loudest voices defending the, the Maduro regime. That's why I'm not going to believe these freaking socialist candidates when they're in campaign and they do the easiest thing which is denouncing a obvious dictatorship like is that really all we need from them to believe them no oh no uh, of, co of course not of course not that's a thing that's why you should never trust the socialists no, no, no. petro i i will give uh boric more of a benefit of the doubt oh than me I too i, I would petro. never no, no no because like let me put it in context when when for example when someone like Boric was defending Chavez, he was back in 2013, when okay. this kid was 25 years old. And right. Petro did it recently, like four but years ago. This Eu, Petro worked hand in hand with the Hugo Chavez government which from day one was allied to the Colombian guerrillas. Guerrilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Like money, like Chavez send them money. Like this is bad news for Colombia if, if that guy wins. Like, very, I, oh, very I, bad news. I honestly think that the, the best thing that you can ever tell someone from Colombia who maybe doesn't know what's going on is like, my bro, my bro, do you see how bad the country right next to you is? Well, this guy actually worked to make that happen. But you know, we know that that argument doesn't work. And I actually want to touch on this. El, you you mentioned it before. Were Venezuelans traumatized by the left? All of these things. Uh, people in the region are tired of hearing our warnings about the far left. And I understand. Yes, there is a little bit of trauma. There's a little bit of. Oh, it's a lot of trauma. <laughs> There's a lot of trauma, but I don't put it all on trauma. Like, we're not just delusional, like, no. crazy people with, yeah. you know, spirals in their eyes. <laughs> I mean, some of us are, to be yeah. fair. There are yeah. ones who have gone to that point. But we're certainly not. And But we do have a special perspective. Like, we have seen from start to collapse... We have seen from the pretty speech that says it's not socialist, that says Q Chavez said Cuba was a dictatorship I know. before getting elected. I so know. this sounds pedantic and bad, but we do, in a, in a way, we come from the future. So, um, yeah, we're sorry that we're annoying, but, like, it's hard to not see the signs. And, like, <laughs> and like uh, in the case of Colombia, like, I just want to be clear with this. I can give the benefit of the doubt to Gabriel Boric. He's a kid. As in have political office. Let's see what he's about. But with Pedro, with Lula in Brazil, I'm terrified. I'm and terrified. Lula is the most dangerous of them all. And I was I was going next to Lula. Lula <sighs> is the most dangerous because Lula was the first sort of model of this new left. Because you know the four he, Sao Paulo? Right. Most I think our view most of our viewers will not have heard about that, but yeah, that was the the birthplace of 21st century social. Yes. Um, but the reason why Lula is so dangerous is he's seen very positively in the international community. He's seen as someone who was good for Brazil, who was good for Brazilian economies. So so this is a, someone who's dangerous to have in the international state still defending the, dicta the socialist dictatorships of Latin America because people abroad, the first worlders, highly respect this guy. And, and I think that's something that really shows you the bias that um, at least the media that 
people outside of South America, outside of Brazil, will tend to consume to be informed about what's going on in Brazil, is that somehow, if if you are a person that doesn't know anything about what's going on, and you research Bolsonaro, and you research Lula on Google, what you're going to find is mm -hmm. that Bolsonaro... It's a far right lunatic that does like crazy shit, which he is. I'm not saying that he's not he's yeah. a far right lunatic. Lula but, is just progressive. But Lula, it's a progressive <laughs> candidate. And if you don't look forward too much, if you don't go to the second page of Google results, you may not know that Lula da Silva is the head of the biggest proven corruption scandal right. in the history of both of the Americas. If you ever, if, if, if the word other brush rings a bell in your brain it should and if it's not then i'm gonna tell you what it is it was an engineering firm that did many projects all over the world they were supposedly taking care of building a new line of, of the metro subway in caracas for example uh this company completely collapsed when a corruption scandal arose and at the top of it was Lula da Silva. He was in prison because of all this that happened. Somehow... But that, this world picture that as an unfair prison, as Bolsonaro coming after him. As Bolsonaro coming after him, he's like, no, 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 wait, wait a second, this guy was the most corrupt guy in the history of Brazil, the most corrupt guy in the history of South America, and both of the Americas for that matter. This is not an innocent guy. And just because he also a... took so much money from Chavez's uh, Shh. and Venezuelan oil boom. I and, mean, and that's the other thing. This guy, to this day, he's a vocal supporter of Nicaragua. He's a vocal supporter of Cuba. He's a vocal supporter of Venezuela. It's not like he's not like the new left. He's not even like Petro, who's trying to hide what he did before. This guy is openly authoritarian. He openly loves authoritarian regimes. And somehow it seems that the international community likes to think that this guy is the solution to the fascists of Jair Bolsonaro, which can How come wrong. we never see the phrase far left in headlines? Like, I, I want to know why it's always... I see far right every day, several times a day in headlines. I never see far left in a headline. Ever. Because I, he, here's what I think. We, we have, or the internet has, normalized calling people that are, for example, neoconservative, populist neoconservatives like Trump, like Bolsonaro, fascists. That word rolls out of their mouth very, very easily. And it is funny. It's funny to call them fascists, but they're really not. If you look at fascism, you got to look at Hitler. You got to look at Mussolini. You got to look at Franco. You got to look at those nationalist, militaristic right. regimes that were somewhat capitalist, but not really more corporatist. Like those regimes of the mid 20th century, nothing to do with what Trump did, for example, or what Bolsonaro has done, for example. And that argument, when you translate it to the other side, yes, technically, if you don't have someone that's a Marxist, Leninist, radical, militaristic person, like, for example, this guy Castillo in Peru, who's a self-described Marxist-Leninist, then you're not going to consider that to be the far left, because the left then just becomes the democratic socialist, the social democrats, etc., etc. The thing is, is that... I guess the problem is, is that it's not really balanced in the way that we approach this topic. Why is it cool and allowed to call Bolsonaro and Donald Trump and Fox in Spain and all these far right political movements, call them far right and associate them with fascism? And it's not OK to call people like Bernie Sanders, people like Boric, people like Petro, even people like Lula as far left when they're oh clearly my on that side I of the spectrum. Saw, I just saw the head, the international headlines for the Colombia election. If they call Duque far right and the other one, just Petro, I'm going to have a heart attack. So they that's something will. to look forward to. You think they will? Like of in course. Headlines? Of course. They, it, as you said, no one really dares to call anyone far left unless they are like a but Soviet Duke style communist. Right at all. I Duke know. Is not far I right. know. I know. But that's what I'm trying to say. That barrier between right, far right, and fascism has completely defuminated. And you know, I have I have a firm belief that these vocabulary issues have an impact 
on the debate and on the solutions and on, on what eventually ends up happening. Of because course they do. Words are losing their meaning. Far right means nothing to me anymore. Like now when I read a headline that says far right, I'm like, okay, I have to look into it because I don't trust them. Look at or, I told you Edu this week. I I was going crazy when Elizabeth Warren said Elon Musk was a freeloader. <laughs> Dude. Dude oh, paid Liz. $1 billion dollars in taxes this year. Oh Liz. It, doesn't she like isn't she in a thing where she doesn't pay taxes or she doesn't pay enough taxes to be saying these kind of things? I don't know. She said she was freaking Native American too. Like nothing means anything. Freaking yeah. the, the richest man in the history of the world who sent fucking spaceships into orbit is a freeloader now. It's a freeloader. <laughs> well, that's that's the absolute state of the left in the United States, I guess. Uh, oh, another thing coming. We haven't really discussed that, and I, d I don't believe we discussed this in our pre-production uh, 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 chat. But uh, midterms are coming. Oh my gosh, that's next year. That's the, that's <gasps> wait. This, that's like now, like like oh, wait. on the fall. I need to look for this because I don't know if you saw it, but we have talked in this show about um, the Hispanic vote and yes. why it's not working for Democrats. It's not. Whoa, things just got really, really bad. A new national PBS Morris poll finds Joe Biden's approval rating is significantly lower with Hispanics than it is with whites. Hispanics approve 33%, disapprove 65%, whites approve 40%. So this is wild. Bad, bad, bad. Like, did, did Trump ever reach these levels of, of disapproval? Um... I actually believe, but I would have to, I don't want to say it because I don't have the documents in me, but I think like approval, Hispanic approval rating of Trump was higher than this one of Biden. There you go. Turns out Hispanic people tend to be more conservative. But you, Who but you know, that's worrying me a lot, Elu, because in the episode that we had about the Hispanic vote, we talked about how white people were trying to justify it and by calling us white supremacists. Yeah. I think this is going to have bring a bad backlash against the hispanic community in this country we gotta stick together like we 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 can continue to be like passive towards the the attacks of privileged urbanite people that want to tell latinos how to vote and how to live um and the truth is Edu, things are hard here right? and of course i'm not blaming the biden administration for this we're in a in a freaking pandemic um but things are tough now we're, we are not getting government aid the people who were getting a child tax credit that no, ended yeah. uh, in yeah. december and they haven't been able to pass resolution that would extend the child the child tax credit inflation i mean like i noticed it shopping for food so i can't imagine like families in this country must be struggling and um I think it's more of that when it comes to the Hispanic vote than us being racist or white supremacists. <laughs> of course, of, of of course it is, and and again, it's just um, Anais was uh, our guest uh, during that episode, and and she mentioned something um, that's important is that this racial divisions, especially the ones that are trying to push towards Latinos now. Um, they are not coming from a real sense of racial discrimination or racial inequality. They are rather coming from a political perspective because Latinos are now associated to be uh, conservatives in the way that they vote, in the way that they, they act, in the way that they operate. Some groups are trying to de-racialize who we are and they're trying to separate hispanics into right. white cubans and white venezuelans before. and white whatever 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 without really not understanding where we're coming from and as we said on that episode because you don't understand where we're coming from you're reaching the wrong conclusions and because you're reaching the wrong conclusions you proceed to insult us and keep us away from your struggle who we may share but again um, it, it doesn't really apply to me thank god i live in this beautiful country called canada but 
body, a eh? But in the United States, it is a big, big problem. Hispanics represent a big chunk of the U.S. population. And now we're, we're the gonna... largest minority. Like most people don't even know that. We're the largest minority. And now we're going to receive the treatment that the, the, the progressives uh, used to de-racialize Asians a couple years ago. We're not going to use that to try to separate uh Latinos that are progressive from Latinos that are conservative because whatever reason that sucks and we need to like be I've like ideally we shouldn't be we shouldn't have to have this conversation we should be able to understand that people will vote based on their own life experiences and based on what they believe but if we continue to see this we as Hispanics we as Latinos need to be belligerent on this we need to face them we need to put a stop to it and say no, hey. this is very important and and it's something we have to keep looking into um even though you know we talked about democracy versus authoritarianism in this country um i think what's happened culturally in this country when it comes to racial issues minority issues is relevant to our topics it is. because it's a way of controlling people it's a way of authoritarianism it's a way of populism um you know, Elu, now it's I, I shared a tweet about this the other day that I was like, it's so true. Like these progressives, they think the way of helping minorities, Hispanics, blacks is to take away grades in school and, uh, you know, the SATs. Be what? Th that what? It's because to me, grades and test scores were how I got into the rooms and the classrooms that I couldn't get in just with money or connections. That is how pe like how minorities can get can arise from whatever situation they're in. Great an equalizer. But that's the thing. You have a very small group of people who do belong to minorities working together with a massive group of mostly white exactly. socialists, urbanists that have this weird messed up conception of what social justice is and what approach we should have to social justice that doesn't really take into consideration what we believe should be done for social justice and by we i mean the vast majority of hispanics living in north america so because we have this perception of the one percent telling what to do to the 99 percent that's when you start right. seeing things like people start categorizing us as latin x regardless of the of the intention behind that of inclusivity and 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 feminism or whatever it really serves to prove a point that they don't listen. They, they just don't, don't listen. listen to us. They don't listen. They, they wanna, refuse. They create a, a, a an image of what the Latino is based on what they think a Latino should be on based on the Latinos that they know from their old social groups are and operate. And they want to impose that into the rest of us. And of course, that's just going to keep people away from what you're trying to achieve. And obviously, yes, you are also contributing to radicalize people to the other side of the aisle. Uh -huh. And you cannot, can't like, and it's, I don't justify anyone because I don't think anyone can be a reactionary and there's a justification for this. I don't just, I'm the first one to make fun of Venezuelan and general Hispanics. No, there's no justification, but there are explanations. But there are explanations. And if you don't want more people in this categories this minority is to keep going to the different side of the aisle from where you're standing what you need to do is for once stop talking and listen to what they have to say a lot of hispanics and i can assure you because i know there's many hispanics who ideologically associate themselves with the liberals or even the progressives and that's fine and that's good but when they're hearing from the other side is constant harassment constant misinterpretation of what our beliefs are and where we're coming from is you're just pushing people away from it and people are unavoidably gonna end up voting for the other side they're honestly pissing people off of course they are like <laughs> 
it's it's as simple as you're pissing people off. And you know what I find? The, the whole Latinx debate is so funny because polls keep coming out about how much Hispanics reject this term. I mean, it's more than rejection. Like many are offended by it. And and every time we have a poll coming out like this, you have the usual suspects of, you know, uh, first generation Americans of Hispanic descent, the ones who are allowed to go on MSNBC or CNN, uh, defending the term Latinx. Like it's like they, they cherry pick the, the Hispanic Americans who are going to support whatever they want them to support. And they only push that. I mean, you're not going to find uh, anyone on CNN or MSNBC saying what Elo and I are saying here. It's just not allowed. That's not the narrative. And even and even take it to because, again, no one here is innocent. Even take it to Fox News. What well, are then you have the opposite? What are the Hispanic voices that you're going to hear in, in Fox News? Obviously, the Hispanic voices that agree with what Fox News has to say. The fact of the matter is that every minority not just hispanics and that just makes me mad because i'm hispanic but every minority they will always have an immense diversity of opinions and ideologies and here's the thing i personally believe that it's important for all of us to start seeing less race and i don't mean it in the sense that we should forget about our differences and our backgrounds and where we're coming from and how our race affects the way that we can live. But when you're starting pe putting people together under the same umbrella, all Hispanics are conservatives, all Hispanics are radically progressive, all Asians are this, or Asians are that, or blacks all are Cubans this, all blacks are, are white supremacists, Trump supporters. What you're doing is alienating people and they're, you, you're creating the opposite effect of what you're trying to do because you're not appealing to the individual. You're appealing to a messed up perception that you have about an entire ethnicity and you're applying it to everyone as an umbrella. So stop doing that. Stop looking at people. Uh, 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 stop, start looking at people as individuals as they are beyond of their race. If they don't agree with what you have to say, don't discard their opinion based on, oh, you're far right, you're far left. They just listen where they're coming from, understand their problems, and maybe then you're going to get their vote. Anyway, so this has been a great episode to finish up the year. Thank you so much, everyone who has supported us through our, our first year being here alive in this beautiful project, in this beautiful podcast that we have. We will continue to make this a, a, a good project. We're going to try to be a little bit more consistent as the new year rolls around. And um, do you have anything to say, Hermana, to say farewell to the people in this holiday season? Um, I just want to thank everyone deeply for watching our show. Um, we have a lot of people who never miss an episode and you guys always text me about what you think. And I really, really appreciate it. I mean, I think giving someone your time is the most precious thing you can give them. So thank you so much uh, for spending time with us this year. And we'll be here next year, uh, hopefully talking about more positive developments but if not we can always cry together and yeah we just want to wish you guys happy holidays from the north and may next year be better than this one <laughs> or not because if we don't then we're going to have amazing shows coming take it easy guys <laughs> bye